Peter Smith, who's the application manager at QLM. QLM are developing a tunable di diode LiDAR gas sensor, so that, that was a mouthful, uh, to monitor greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I'll hand right over to you, Doug. Thanks, Elliot. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, so yeah, my name is Doug Millington Smith. Uh, I am the Applications Manager at QLM. Um, my role uh, is to uh, understand uh, customer requirements, turn them into technical requirements, and go in the other direction, demonstrate the equipment, uh, explain how it works, train users, and provide ongoing application support. I have some slides for you, and let's see if my sharing screen works. Nearly. Right. You can all see that. Uh, do please stop me uh, if you cannot. So uh, I want to take you through a quantum solution to quantification. Let's see if I can get rid of that. And go away. There we are. So, um, so we start with methane. Um, methane is atrocious. Uh, it is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, um, 84 times as bad over a 20 year period, and the oil and gas sector emitted something in the order of 82 megatons of it in 2019. That's a great deal. However, there is a silver lining to the problem of methane being so potent and so nasty. It has a short lifespan in the atmosphere, much shorter than CO2, and therefore mitigating emissions of methane now will have a real and measurable impact on climate change in the shorter term, buying us time to deal with a much longer term, uh, bigger problem of CO2. This is gaining traction among operators, oil and gas uh, majors, and they're all starting to make their own individual pledges about how they're going to achieve net zero or monitor methane at their facilities or reduce their emissions. Some are being compelled to do so by law. Um, at the um, very front of the uh, pack just about is BP. Uh, who have pledged to uh, install uh, or methane monitoring equipment at their sites um, by 2023. That really isn't a long way away and it presents a major challenge to them because monitoring methane is even more atrocious than methane is itself. Methane emissions come in many, many forms uh, and trying to monitor them all is really quite difficult. Consider exhausts and vents. These are big pieces of processing equipment who spew out um, exhaust, which includes methane, at known times. You have flares. If you imagine um, those uh, images you've seen on the news of oil rigs with a big burner off to the side of them, that's a flare. That's burning off excess methane. Um, those uh, give out either CO2 or methane, depending on whether or not they're lit or not, uh, from a known location, but at unknown times. Fugitive emissions. Uh, these are leaks in processing equipment, so valves and pipes and joints. Uh, these can all leak to a small amount to some extent, and finding them, because they're such small and widely distributed links, <laughs> leaks, is very difficult. And any solution to monitoring methane, and therefore reducing methane, has to take into account all of these different types. It's sufficiently difficult that frequently operators don't even try, they just guess. Uh, they take emissions factors, multipliers associated with each piece of equipment, they take the number of pieces of equipment on their site, add the multiplier, and that is the estimated emissions of methane on the site. As I'm sure you can guess, that is woefully inaccurate. When they do carry out leak detection repair operations, they're slow, expensive, and labour intensive because you've got to pay someone to walk around with one piece of equipment which will detect the emission, and then pay someone else to walk around with a piece of equipment that quantifies it. And worse, after you've done that ridiculously long um, process, mm -hmm. uh, you only have a snapshot in time. It tells you what the facility is doing then, not tomorrow. If a piece of equipment springs a leak the day after the survey, you lose it until the next survey. That can be three months, six months, 12 months down the line. How much methane are you spewing out into the atmosphere and not knowing about it until you go and do your next survey? There has to be a better solution. Well, there is, but if it were that simple, everyone would be doing it already. You monitor all the time. And there are a number of technologies which are approaching this from different sides. Um, however, none of them have a quantum advantage, which is why they don't work very well. The oldest, uh, most venerable solution is, uh, is networks of point sensors. These are chemical sensors dotted around the site. They're cheap, easy to deploy, but they require lots of calibration. They don't tell you where the emission is and they don't tell you how big it is. So they don't really give you too much information. You can get infrared based sensor cameras, which uh, will um, visualize the, 
the methane emission as black smoke against a grey background or as false colour smoke against a false colour background. This is great for, great for localising the emission and it's normally what the first of those two walking over surveys uses, but it doesn't tell you how much methane is there, the leak rate. Open power spectroscopy, um, taking IR spectroscopy out of the laboratory and putting it uh, into the open atmosphere. This is great for quantification. It tells you how much is there, but it doesn't tell you where it's coming from. So this quantifies without localizing. Satellites, lots of, um, <laughs> um, lots of prestige around uh, things like GHG sat at the moment. These are great because these both visualize and quantify, provided that the emission is huge. It's not nighttime, it's not cloudy, and, and you're only looking to localize within about a 25 meter square. It can't tell you, uh, you where the small leaks are coming from. It can't localize them to a piece of equipment. And if it's pointing in the wrong direction, it won't actually, um, it won't actually catch the emissions coming out of your uh, facility. So all of these have serious limitations as to their effectiveness to provide a total monitoring solution for the industry. The industry needs something light, versatile, portable, which will continuously and autonomously monitor, interpret and report methane emissions. Enter QLM. QLM stands for either quantum light metrology or quit leaking methane, we can't quite decide. It was the brainchild of uh, our chief technology officer who uh, was studying uh, postgraduate research at the University of Bristol, that's Zhao Ai. He was working on single photon LIDAR for gas sensing. I won't go into the technology too deeply in this presentation uh, because it would take me a very long time. I will very happily send you a white paper afterwards if you'd like it. Um, he found that his solution for, um, for monitoring greenhouse gases um, could be used to monitor methane at uh, oil and gas facilities. He took this to uh, Bristol University's quantum accelerator, QTEC, and they agreed with him. They paired him with a mentor in the form of Murray Reed. Murray uh, has spent 30 years in Silicon Valley uh, commercializing quantum technology, uh, and so we had an eye for a winner. He liked Zhao's idea as well, went into business with him and became our CEO in 2019. Working for them, our head of engineering, Alex, um, works with, with, a, with a, a, um, a highly skilled team of uh, engineers who are building the equipment, carrying out R&D in our lab at Unit DX, just over the river uh, near Temple Mead Station. And underpinning them, um, adding some gravity to the situation, is our uh, Chief Science Officer, John Rarity, who moonlights as our CSO when he's not acting as a Professor of Optical Communication Systems at the University. That's who we are and why we do what we do, that major problem about monitoring methane. How do we actually do it? Well, um, I, um, um, I mentioned I won't spend too long on the technology because I could spend forever. This is a whistle stop. We take two pieces of technology which uh, are known individually and then we combine them together in a unique way. So the first thing we take is LIDAR. LIDAR was developed for, uh, for autonomous vehicles. It gives you a spatial uh, indication of what is in the area. Uh, it bounces off objects that are solid to the light and bounces back to uh, the counter. Um, normally, um, it, the uh, detector you have for doing this will only give you range. You need something more sensitive in order to give you something more. So we take our LIDAR, we fire it out into the world at the absorption wavelength of methane, to which methane appears as a solid object. And then we employ a quantum single photon avalanche detector, a SPAD. It's like a Geiger counter for light. Um, where a normal camera uh, needs huge amounts of photons to uh, deliver an image, this only needs, needs a few tens of photons per second. That few tens of photons per second hits the detector and we can do spectroscopy with that. So we have the size, we have the shape, and we have the concentration of uh, the methane plume that we are looking at, making use of this quantum technology. The laser is very low power and ice safe. Uh, um, the detector is incredibly sensitive uh, because it's a, uh, um, um, a quantum single photon detector. And the technology is relatively mature, meaning we can um, scale when we, uh, if we need to. That's what we uh, do. Does it work? We've been to uh, controlled release trials. Um, it, um, the most famous of one is probably um, at Taddy in the south of France. Taddy is a controlled release facility run by Total. Uh, they uh, have set up an area with lots of old pieces of processing equipment, which they have rigged up with hundreds of little controlled release points so they can fire methane out of many different areas. And they will tell you when they are releasing methane, but they will not tell you how much or where from. And your challenge is to detect, localize, quantify, and report where the methane is coming from. We went there last year, did what we do best, 
sorry, not last year, 2019. 2020 didn't happen, let's face it. Um, uh, uh, we visualized the emissions. Uh, we were able to calculate the release rate using uh, the shape of the plume and the prevailing wind conditions. And we calculated the release rate with a, a reasonable degree of uncertainty. Um, our accuracy was pretty good. Um, we had a good correlation between what we calculated and what was actually being released. We uh, asked to go back there last year and they said, yep, come along. And we said, oh, great, uh, 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 what's our competition this time? Because this was done with about 12 other solutions. And they said, oh, nobody else, just you. No one else had made the grade. Um, we went there again last year. As you can see, we improved our visualization somewhat. And I'd love to tell you about how accurate we were, but on seeing our data last year, the first thing Total asked for was an NDA. These are the only two publicly accessible pieces of information, these two images, uh, and I can tell you no more. But you can infer what you wish about uh, an oil and gas major seeing our results and immediately requesting an NDA. So that's uh, how we do it. What are we actually doing? Well, we're making cameras. These are uh, cameras that incorporate that combination of technology and give you methane detection and quantification at the same time. Uh, they uh, currently sit on a pole, so they can rove around on a pan tilt, looking up and down and around, so they can uh, cover an entire facility. They can um, measure tiny amounts of methane, ambient methane concentration, all the way up to uh, huge blowouts. We can do that over a long range, about 200 meters on land, and we can um, take that concentration measurement and calculate it as a, a um, small to very, very big leak flow rate uh, with that aforementioned relatively high accuracy. We have a GUI that's been built um, by one of our uh, 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 technological partners for us. At present, it is incredibly manual. Uh, it is very much a case of move camera to where you want, turn camera on, turn camera off, process data. We're working on improving it. This leads us to our vision for the future. This is what we anticipate cameras will be uh, doing um, over the course of, how am I doing for time? All right, okay. Um, over the course of the next few years. Here is our QLM protected gas plant. And here is our QLM camera, the QLM1 as it's called, mounted nice and high on a pole looking down over the facility. It scans the area with its LIDAR. It's not purple, that's marketing, it's IR, it's invisible. Uh, it scans in a pattern, uh, allowing it to cover a relatively large area without too much um, movement. When it finds methane, it is, uh, zooms in on the emission, uh, increasing resolution as a function of time. And this informs operators not just where the leaks are, but with what level of urgency they need to go and repair them. Is it a big blowout or is it a tiny little leak? It can also monitor those planned emissions, things like vents and chimneys, as previously mentioned. We are developing a flying version. Uh, that's going to come in about two years time. And we're developing a handheld version as well. Uh, so you can walk around looking in real time. That's uh, coming a further couple of years down the line. But even the pole mounted solution is a more flexible, lightweight, robust, continuous option than the industry currently has access to. And quantum technology has enabled us to achieve that. So where's our money coming from? Well, um, we have two major sources of funding, uh, um, the first of which is Innovate UK projects. We uh, have one we are applying for more. Um, the, the one we have is called SPLICE. It stands for Single Photon LiDAR Imaging of Carbon Emissions, and it is a multi-user um, consortium, all of which have the vision of taking QLM's technology from the laboratory bench out into the real world. You can see we have academic, technological, government, industry backing um, within this consortium, including our industrial partners, the National Grid, BP, and Amatec Land. Just going into what the industrial partners do a little bit. Uh, the National Grid um, uh, um, manage the UK's natural gas pipelines, among other things, at 8,000 kilometres of pipeline and 600 above ground installations. We're going to go to one of their big terminals uh, called Bacton uh, in the east of England um, later on this year and do a live trial where we are going to look for emissions they don't know about. And at the same time, um, the, the National Physical Laboratory are going to be carrying out a traditional slow walkover study and we're going to compete with them. We're going to see if A, we can detect as much as National Physical Laboratory do, and B, hopefully detect things that NPL cannot. NPL want to lose this particular challenge because it will uh, be beneficial for everybody. Amatec Land uh, are a process analytical technology company for industry. Uh, they uh, make monitors for furnaces and the like. Um, furnaces are becoming um, a, um, a, 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 um, a, a, a progress point uh, for uh, green tech because uh, in order to make uh, hydrogen for the hydrogen economy, you need to uh, burn something. You either need to burn methane or ammonia. And um, 
therefore monitoring what goes into and, and what comes out of these furnaces is going to be very useful for the future. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of Amatex, uh, director, uh, of Amatex Director of Innovation and Technology, Pete Drogmuller, who recognises that continuous monitoring will give a far, far better solution than the intermittent monitoring they're currently carrying out. Time. I have eight minutes left. Okay, um, that includes questions, right? Uh, BP are transitioning from a oil company to a renewable energy company by way of natural gas. The reason they're doing, the reason they're using natural gas is because natural gas is the cleanest fossil fuel, in that it only burns the CO two rather than uh, other messy messy byproducts. However, it is only the cleanest fossil fuel if it stays in the pipelines. If as little as three percent of the natural gas that is drawn up from underground is 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 vented to the atmosphere, we might as well also be burning coal. So they have to keep it in the pipes. Um, BP are looking to use QLM's technology as one of their ways of, of monitoring methane at their sites by 2023. They're going to take us to an onshore facility next year, probably in Germany, and the following year we're going to uh, go out to a oil rig uh, to carry out trials in the harshest of conditions. I mentioned next year and onwards, we have so many things we want to do to improve this camera. It's very manual at the moment. There's so much more we need to do. Make it smaller and lighter so it'll fit on a drone. Scale the production so we reduce the unit cost. Make it ATEX compliant so it's spark free and can go into hazardous locations. Expand the GUI so we can schedule measurements and we can make the um, software think for itself so we don't need someone watching the camera to um, record methane emissions. Integration into site safety systems so automated alerts, automated additions to the methane inventory are added. All of this is coming over the next two to three years. And for that, we're going to need some more. <laughs> and for that, we're going to need some more funding, but I'll get onto that in about a minute's time. We're going to expand the number of gases that we're able to measure. We can currently do methane and we can do CO2, but uh, we're going to expand that to um, other gases relevant to the oil and gas industry, the petrochemicals industry, the environmental science industry. All of these are, these are ecologically sensitive, either in terms of global warming, air quality or, um, or smog. And, we, yeah, and the march of technology of span technology will bring these into our sphere in the next three to four years. We're starting to gain contraction. Bloomberg named us a BNF pioneer uh, this year, um, one of 12 companies in a cohort answering difficult questions about um, the battle against climate change. Our particular difficult question, along with a couple of satellite companies, was, uh, was monitoring um, the environment, environmental monitoring. Um, they are going to be promoting us over the course of the uh, next year. Do please go and subscribe to Bloomberg NEF. You'll read all about our company and we're very, very happy to be with them. We've managed to secure ourselves some seed round of funding. We secured this on April the 16th, it closed, uh, and we have a, um, a investor cohort uh, which would represent um, local investors, uh, green tech investments, um, oil and gas services, uh, is, is led by the Green Angel Syndicate, the UK's only green tech angel syndicate. Uh, and we have uh, the Development Bank of Wales, the Newable Venture Fund, Enterprise 100 from the LBS, Bristol Private Equity Club, BPEC, Britbox, the UK uh, Erotic Scale-Up Fund, and Champion X, X, an oil field services company based in Houston. And they all share QLM's vision of enabling organisations to achieve net zero through mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. That is our core requirement. That's what we want to do. We achieved this by way of uh, developing technology that provides a true understanding of greenhouse gas emissions using camera systems that continually visualize and quantify greenhouse gas emissions. That is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I see there's some questions to answer. Thanks, Brad. Uh, if it's all right, I think I'll, I'll feed you a couple. Firstly, I wanted to say uh, it's really interesting to hear from a, a quantum company that's not just kind of chasing the, the kind of the esoteric goals of like computing or kind of um kind of like ultimate secrecy it's, it's got it's nice to kind of hear from someone who's got quite a kind of grounded ambition but that can also kind of save the world right because you're you're talking about detecting methane um all of the uh, applications of quantum are um extremely uh relevant and extremely a uh, real world they'll become that way but um maybe uh what we're doing is a little bit e easy to access because um yeah methane is a uh, hot topic right now uh and will remain that way for the next 30 or 40 years as we try to mitigate its uh, production uh, so um yes i appreciate that it is um a a more easy to act um a more easy to access problem for uh, the general public well as, as well it's it's great that um because the, the common theme for a lot of the technologies now, things like computing, is that uh, we just need better technology, right? We just need better detectors. We just need better sources. 
So it's great we can kind of develop that at the same time as kind of actually making it marketable and, and using it as yeah. like immediately app applicable. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah, very much so uh, and um yeah and there are um multiple uh, well, entities recognizing this uh, we're very grateful to uh, the support of the national quantum technologies program nqtp uh, who are underpinning the splice project and are providing us uh, with uh, with industrial opportunities and exposure um uh, we're one of the first technologies to uh, commercialize out of uh, the nqtp and uh, yeah, so it's a source of uh, mutual pride for both of us Right, so I'll get down to some questions from the audience, uh, yep. for my personal uh, inquiries. Uh, so uh, uh, there's there's a, quite a few saying that this is a, an amazing presentation and just thanking you, just like generally. Um, quite a few are just in awe of the kind of presentation and the videos. So. I'm here to please. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear. Uh, so the, the kind of the first um, question I'd like to put to you is, uh, how uh, this is from Samir Biko. Yep. Sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, how applicable, uh, nearly, uh, is this solution in other situations? So, right. for example, you can imagine different industries wanting yep. to suspense meeting. Right, yes. Um, it, um, very and increasingly. Uh, so um, oil and gas is our um, first source of uh, customers because they have, uh, they have the deepest pockets. Um, yeah. However, there are other um, applications uh, Consider biogas facilities, consider landfills. Both of these spew out methane as a matter of course. Um, yeah, um, I mentioned that we're going to expand the range of gases we're looking at. If we expand into things like ammonia, um, then, then agricultural emissions become very, very applicable. Um, agriculture is actually the biggest source of methane emissions worldwide. It produces around about 30 or 40 percent more methane than the oil and gas industry does. Um, and that's mainly from, uh, from ruminant digestion, uh, so monitoring cows and sheep. This is a different challenge to monitoring um, methane emissions from oil and gas because it's more diffuse. So um, the development will continue on that, but we do have some plans to uh, put the camera in a cow shed over the course of the next 18 months and see what we can do. When we um, are able to then monitor ammonia, um, it, it, um, emissions from pigs and chicken farming will become very relevant. Um, it, um, but because the primary pollutant the source from those is ammonia, at which point it, we'll have a total agricultural solution. Um, other gases, nitrous oxide spewed out by uh, car exhausts. Imagine being able to monitor uh, vehicle exhausts, so aircraft exhausts, um, shipping exhausts, um, using nitrous oxide monitors, our cameras. Again, eminently possible to do, given the march of technology. We're not there yet because we need, need spa technology to improve. But we have multiple applications we can do now with methane and CO2, and we're going to expand in the future. Okay, so uh, to, to link that to a different question we've got, is, it, is kind of changing to a different gas, for example, just, just limited by your detectors? At the moment, yes. The lasers exist. Um, the SPAD is uh, the limiting factor. The SPAD is, um, uh, is still a constantly developing piece of equipment. So uh, consider... Uh, yeah, um, it, it, uh, it can currently receive a certain range of wavelengths. As we expand the range of wavelengths it can receive, which our academic partners are doing, um, we, uh, um, um, we will be able to detect other gases. Um, uh, other uh, sensors work by being cryogenically cooled. Um, if you walk around a site with a uh, FLIR camera, that's the, uh, the optical gas imaging camera, it constantly mm -hmm. vibrates. That's because it has a Stirling cryo cooler uh, running, keeping the sensor cold. We don't need that, but it does limit the uh, the uh, range of wavelengths we can receive. As the yeah, SPAD yeah. technology improves, we'll be able to um, meet that problem. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've, I've found that a big problem is that you can have almost as good a detector as you want, but if you know at certain wavelengths, it has to kind of get exponentially bigger, exponentially noisier. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so next, I think we're, we're slightly over time, but there's quite a few I'm, questions. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, uh, so I think one of them's kind of already been answered. Uh, so they're asking what stage of development is your project? Right. So, okay. Uh, We're at what's referred to as TRL7. Uh, yeah. So we have prototypes out uh, in, uh, uh, in um, field trials at the moment. If someone came to us with a purchase order right now, um, we could sell them a camera. Uh, however, we would probably say we'd recommend you wait until next year when we'll have a TRL 8 or 9 camera uh, ready to sell. It'll be smaller, it'll be lighter, it'll uh, have a more automated GUI. Uh, so we could sell to you right now. How many would you like? Um, but, uh, it, it, but, but we may recommend that you wait until next year. 
Uh, and the final one, I think, to cap it off and kind of come back to the careers in quantum uh, aspect of things is, uh, what sort of skills would you look for in someone applying to you? Uh, to QLM? Um, yes. yeah. Diverse ones. Um, <laughs> we are a company of nine people. Um, until six weeks ago, we were a company of seven people, which means you will not only wear one hat. Um, it, it, uh, for example, I joined as the applications manager. In addition to the applications uh, uh, management role, I've been responsible for business development, for marketing communications, as you might better tell from the presentation, um, uh, for office management, for transport logistics. Um, it, it, uh, um, you will not only use one skill set, you will use multiple skill sets um, when you uh, apply for a career in uh, for a career in quantum technology because these companies are not tens of thousands of employees. They do not have incredibly well demarked roles. Uh, roles. So uh, diversification of your skill set is something you should expect and enjoy during the course of the, um, so the you know, of working for QLM or another quantum technology firm. I suppose the big bonus of that is uh, you get to see how things work across the board, right? It's not just a case yeah. of like, accounting or sort that out or like someone in HR does that job. Like you exactly. Are. <laughs> it's very, well, very different to working in a uh, huge company. Uh, um, I've done both, uh, and this is more exciting, if more, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, if sometimes a bit more hectic. Hmm. I can imagine. Okay, thanks for that, Doug. I think we'll, we'll have a short break now. Um, so we're due to break until about half past, uh, when we've got another talk. Um, but Doug, thanks for that. That was an amazing slideshow, uh, and <laughs> and thanks for the question, uh, the answers. Thank you very much indeed for your time, everyone. Cheers. Right. Uh, thanks, everyone.